Hello there, AP Environmental Science class. Okay, we are now moving on to Chapter 9, Sustaining Biodiversity, Saving Species, and Ecosystem Services. All right, so once again, uh, this will be done in two parts. Uh, it's about 52 slides, I think there was. Uh, so again, this will be a, uh, a two-part lecture. So let's get right into it. So we first start off with a core case study talking about where have all the honeybees gone. And, and I'll tell you what, um, this is uh, actually a story that is close to my heart. I took a, a class called beekeeping when I, when I was at uh, Cornell as an undergraduate. Uh, and it was one of the uh, best classes I ever, ta uh, ever took. It was a lot of fun. Uh, we got to play with bees. We got to uh, uh, eat their honey. Uh, I got to dress up in the outfit and have the bees, the honeybees crawl all over me. And so when I hear stuff about this, uh, it, 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 it disturbs me because uh, bees uh, play a huge key role in, in, in pollination. That's their ecosystem service uh, that bees provide for us. So they pollinate uh, not only flowers, but, but our crops. European honeybees pollinate over 70% of the vegetable and food crops out there. Commercial beekeepers actually truck hives to farms to pollinate different crops. And, it's in, 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 um, interesting, uh, it, what's interesting is that the professor that taught the beekeeping class, I was also a commercial beekeeper and he would actually do that. He would take his far his, his beehives and, tr and truck them to different farms in the Ithaca area uh, to actually uh, help those farms pollinate uh, the different crops that they had. But right now we have something called colony collapse disorder. You may have heard of this. Um, this is when all bees abandon a colony and it's affected uh, 23 to 43 percent of European honeybees in the U.S. between 2008 and 2015. So you may have heard some stories of this. Uh, European honeybee population has been cut in half over the past 50 years. We're not exactly sure uh, what is the reason for these declines, but probably uh, possible reasons are parasites, viruses, pesticide use, stress from transportation and overwork, and poor, nutri poor, poor nutrition from a pollinating a single crop. And we'll talk about that uh, more when we talk about how, again, I think I've mentioned it in this class, having uh, acres and acres of corn doesn't help anybody. Okay. Yeah, not only does it decrease biodiversity, uh, but obviously gives uh, bees poor nutrition because they're pollinating a single crop. Uh, and just like humans, right, we need to eat different types of food, uh, fruits, foods, vegetables, meat, etc. cetera. Um, bees, other insects, other animals uh, need a, a variety in their diet as well. So here is that little guy, the European honeybee. Again, guys, these are not yellow jackets. These are not hornets, okay? Uh, these are bees, and they're actually fairly docile. So again, um, if you see a honeybee flying around, don't kill it. Don't kill it. Let it land on you. It'll walk around your finger. It won't sting you. Um, it's the wasps. Those are the ones that those are the ones that are going to get you. Those yellow jackets and those hornets. All right. So, what role do humans play in the loss of species and ecosystem services? Well, species are becoming extinct at at least one thousand times faster than the historical rate. And by the end of this century, the extinction rate is expected to be ten thousand times higher than the historical rate. And this is why we say we are now in the sixth mass extinction currently. Um, again, you know, we, we feel that that's the case because uh, we're seeing uh, species become extinct at such a greater rate than, than ever before. Uh, we believe we are in that in that sixth mass extinction right now. So uh, a couple of things to uh, terms to know, a biological extinction occurs when a species can no longer be found anywhere on earth. All right, we call that a biological extinction. Now, extinction is a natural process, okay? Background extinction measures the natural rate, and that's usually one ex extinct species per year per one million species. So again, a very, very, very small number. Mass extinctions occur uh, when the extinction of many species happens in a short period of time, which is again what we're seeing now and why we believe now we are in uh, another mass extinction currently. Uh, past causes most likely involve global changes in environmental conditions, uh, and that's what it's causing um, one of the reasons why we're seeing uh, a lot of extinctions happening right now. There are other reasons as well, and we're going to talk about a lot of them uh, in this chapter. Mass extinctions can be an opportunity, however, for, for species to fill empty ecological niches. So, for instance, uh, us mammals, um, people, there's a hypothesis out there that if the dinosaurs didn't become extinct, that there would not be human beings on this planet because what happened is when the dinosaurs became extinct, um, 
and I think it was 70 to 80 percent of the creatures uh, be, be, became extinct with the dinosaurs. What creatures survived? The little mammals. The little mammals survived. And then after the dinosaurs were all gone, those little mammals were able to take over the earth and eventually evolve into, amongst other things, us human beings. So if that mass extinction hadn't occurred, right, 65 million years ago, and the dinosaurs did not die, uh, more than likely I would not be providing you with this lecture because we would not be around because dinosaurs would still be roaming the earth and uh, mammals would not have had the chance uh, to fill those 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 empty niches so again mass extinction sometimes can be an opportunity um but again we don't necessarily want to see them especially uh those mass extinctions if they're not happening naturally again humans kind of causing the current mass extinction and that obviously isn't good human population has destroyed and degraded habitats so that's uh, another reason uh that we are getting uh these mass extinctions uh, because of our huge resource consumption and large ecological footprint and again extinction rates have arisen recently current extinction rate, again, 1,000 times higher than the natural background rate. Rate of extinction and threats to ecosystem services are likely to rise sharply or continue to rise sharply in the next 50 to 100 years due to harmful human impacts. Again, extinction is now 1,000 times the natural background rate. We've had that. You're seeing that, uh, that, 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 that statistic pop up here. All right. So I think it's one that you may want to remember. Large-scale loss of species would greatly impact ecosystem services that humans rely on. For instance, bees pollinating crops, right? We need to get our, po our crops pollinated in order to eat. We're losing those bees. We're losing that eco ecosystem service. Biologically diverse environments are also being eliminated or fragmented. And we'll talk about what that means, especially the fragmentation uh, in just a couple of slides. So Science Focus 9.1 talks about estimating extinction rates. There's a problem, though, in estimating exact extinction rates, and that's because a natural extinction of species is a long process, and so it's difficult to document. So again, while I'm saying we believe we're in the sixth mass extinction right now, uh, it's actually hard to... Uh, put a number on that because it is such a long process. In addition, we have identified only 2 million of the 7 to 10 million species we believe are here on Earth. So we don't really know what those other species are doing because we haven't uh, identified them yet. Uh, we also know little about ecological roles of most of the identified species. So again, environmental science, this is a rather new science uh, in the last 50, 60, 70 years. And uh, so for you guys getting out of college in a couple of years looking for jobs, a uh, great place uh, in the environmental sciences. Approach, observe how reductions in habitat area affect extinction rates, and then maybe you can uh, extrapolate those numbers uh, to uh, estimate the extinction rates a, a, a little better. All right, so what are endangered and threatened species? Uh, well, they are ecological smoke alarms. So an endangered species is one that there are so few individuals around that the species could soon become extinct. A threatened species or a vulnerable species, still enough individuals to survive, but the numbers are declining and they may soon become endangered. Many species have characteristics that make them vulnerable to extinction. We talked about those case-selected species in, in a previous chapter, and we'll look at a chart that talks about those characteristics in just a minute. So again, an endangered species, we are really worried that they're going to become extinct because there's so few of them around. Threatened species, vulnerable, they're not endangered yet, but they're heading that way because their numbers are declining. So here are some of four critically endangered species uh, that have become endangered largely because of human activity. So you'll notice the Mexican gray wolf, uh, about 42 in the forests of Arizona and New Mexico. That's all that's left. The California condor, uh, 229 in the southwest United States, up from nine. So helping out there a little bit. Whooping crane, only 437 left in North America. And the Sumatran tiger, maybe 400 to 600 uh, on the Indonesian island of Sumatra. So again, just four examples of uh, critically endangered species that could become extinct very soon. Here is the, or the characteristics, okay, that we talk about 
that may provide or may cause a species to become extinct faster than another species. So for instance, low pre reproductive rate, that K strategus or that K selective species, blue whales, giant pandas, rhinoceroses, specialized niches like the panda, the blue whale, the Everglades kite, they can only live in certain small areas. So when you get rid of those areas, then obviously those animals cannot adapt quick enough and so they could go extinct. Uh, a narrow distribution, all right, Right? The elephant seal, the desert pupfish, meaning they only live, again, in a little area. Feeds at a high trophic level. So that's another characteristic that could lead to uh, a species becoming endangered. Uh, examples, the Bengal, Bengal tiger, the bald eagle, the grizzly bear. Fixed migratory patterns, okay? If your migratory patterns are fixed and then humans come in and disrupt that migratory pattern in some way, uh, that's going to disrupt um disrupt your your breeding, disrupt how many uh, offspring you you will produce. So the blue whale, the whooping crane, sea turtle, examples of that. Rare, just species that are rare to begin with, the African violets, some orchids. Uh, commercially valuable, right? So the snow leopard, the tiger, the elephant, the rhinoceros, rare plants and birds, right? They, they, they get a lot of money on the open market. So a lot of people want to get them for that money. And so that could lead to their extinction. And animals that require large territories like the condor, the grizzly bear, the Florida panther. Again, we'll talk about how these territories are being fragmented by humans. And that if you need a large territory, your territory gets fragmented. Uh, that could potentially lead to your extinction as well. So definitely understand these charts. Okay, we've been seeing these charts show up. Uh, definitely understand some characteristics uh, that could potentially uh, lead a species to become extinct. All right, so why should we try to sustain wild species and the ecosystem services they provide? Well, reasons to avoid hastening the extinction of wild species. They provide valuable ecosystem and economic services. So again, I keep going back to the bees, uh, pollinating our crops, very valuable. It can take millions of years for nature to recover from large scale extinctions, right? If you think about the previous mass extinctions on the planet, uh, it took millions of years for, for life to really take root once again. Many people believe that species have a right to exist regardless of their usefulness to humans. So that's more of the uh, morality take uh, on why we should be sustaining and preserving uh, wild species and the ecosystem services that, that, that they provide. So an example are the orangutans. They're only about 61,000 in the wild. Uh, tropical forest habitat is being cleared to grow palm oil. And what do you, how do you grow palm oil? You just plant rows and rows and rows of palm trees, right? So that's what's happening. These, these very diverse tropical rainforests are being cut down uh, and you're just putting one type of tree, palm oil, not good. They are illegally smuggled and sold, though, those orangutans. They have the lowest birth rate of all animals, okay? And so again, these are reasons why um, uh, the orangutan were worried that they're going to become extinct and they may disappear within two decades without urgent protective uh, action. And again, here are uh, some, of those, uh, some of those orangutans. These are actually uh, in Borneo. All right, so Species provide vital ecosystem services. Again, we talked about pollination, but species also provide pest control, right? Uh, this is one I always argue with my kids about because my daughter and my wife are scared of spiders and they always want me to kill spiders. I don't like killing spiders. Why? Because spiders catch mosquitoes right? And catch flies. They are a pest control, right? You have that fly, you know, that, 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 uh, that spider with its web, uh, it, it traps, it gets, it's a pest control, right? That's the ecosystem service. So I always say, let the spiders live. Oxygen production, okay? Another ecosystem service for, uh, provided by species. Many plants and animals provide economic value, medicinal drugs as well. Uh, extinction can hinder speciation. So think about that. We didn't talk about that. But when you have extinctions, when you have less species, then you have a smaller chance of getting a new species, right? Because we have all these ways that new species can come around, natural selection, co-evolution, things like that. But if you're reducing the number of species to begin with, you're also then going to reduce the number of new species that, that, that we are going to get through those processes. So something to think about. Many, and again, many people believe species have an intrinsic right to exist, okay? That's, that's the uh, morality. What makes a human being better than that spider? Why should I I kill that spider? What makes me better than it? These are the questions. And again, big question mark, which species should we protect? And do we protect others 
over some other types and, and things like that. So again, this is when you get in, into the moral uh, uh, thinking of, of, of environmental science. Uh, so here are just uh, some more natural capital or some more ecosystem services. This is actually nature's pharmacy, right? These are all plants and I'll read a few, the foxglove, the Pacific hue, um, the rosy periwinkle, and, and you'll notice what they can actually do for us. So for instance, the foxglove, um, you can actually use for heart failure to help to help uh, a human being overcome that. The Pacific U can be helped uh, to can, can help ovarian cancer, right? The rosy periwinkle, all right, can can help uh, alleviate symptoms from Hodgkin's disease uh, and types of leukemia. So again, pharmacy, we use this stuff, and so when they become extinct, we obviously you lose the natural capital uh, that the Earth is providing us. And yet another one. So that was a pharmacy. This is the Hyacinth macaw, uh, actually in uh, Mato Grosso, Brazil. And what happens? This is a source of beauty and pleasure for many people, uh, these birds. I had a friend of mine who actually uh, had, had two of these birds, or still does, because they live 100 years. Um, you always want to get two. If you're going to get a parrot, make sure you're or a macaw, make sure you get two, because if you have one, he had one for a while, my friend, uh, and uh, the bird actually got so anxious, it was by itself, it actually would eat itself, it would eat its feathers like, like people bite their nails. Um, so if you're going to get a parrot, make sure to get two, so they always have a friend. Um, but again, uh, these are going extinct, and they provide beauty and pleasure for people. Uh, so again, more natural capital uh, that the earth provides us. So how do humans accelerate species extinction and degradation of ecosystem services? All right, so you want to memorize this acronym HIPCO, all right? These are your six greatest threats to species, all right? The H stands for habitat loss, degradation, or fragmentation. The I stands for invasive species, which again are not native to the environment they're in. Uh, the P, the first P stands for population and resource use, use growth. The second P stands for pollution. C stands for climate change. And O stands for the over exploitation of our resources. So remember and memorize HIPCO. Habitat loss, invasive species, population growth, pollution, climate change, and over-exploitation. These are the six greatest threats to species that humans are unfortunately uh, uh, doing uh, to the to the environment. All right, so first we'll talk about habitat destruction and fragmentation. So habitat fragmentation occurs when large intact habitats are divided into smaller isolated patches. It's, all, it's just as bad as destroying the, the entire habitat, believe it or not. This is caused by roads, logging, crops, and other and, and other urban development. Uh, barriers limit species ability, uh, ability to disperse and colonize area, areas, locate food, and locate mates. So for for instance, our first example here uh, is the habitat destruction and fragmentation of a couple of animals. So on the upper left is the Indian tiger. You'll notice its range about 100 years ago is in the blue here. And you'll notice the range today, again, fragmented. They don't have that entire territory to move around. They only have those little red areas now to move around. And that's because of urban development or maybe uh, their, their habitat has been destroyed for crops, things like that. Look Look at the black rhino. Again, range in the 1700s. All of this, right? Now, only in these couple of little pockets right here will you find a black rhino. Elephant, probable range 1600s, pretty much most of Africa, right? Now, only in these red areas. And then the Asian or Indian elephant, same thing. The former range in blue, you'll notice the fragmented range today in red, okay? So just four examples of how uh, destruction causes this fragmentation. And again, if you're an animal that needs a large range to survive, well, obviously now you don't have that anymore, and so your survival becomes that much difficult. And this is, again, just an example. Anybody, whoever is in a plane, okay, next time you're in a plane flying anywhere here in the U.S., look down and you will see stuff like this. So what do we have? Here you have forest areas, right? I would argue in this picture, okay, 100, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, this entire box here was this forest, right? But now what has happened? The forest has been cut down. We have some cropland. We have some uh, urban development or suburban development here, people's homes, right? You have roads that are going through. So an animal that maybe roamed this entire 
area here a couple of hundred years ago now can only live in this little area, now can only live in this little area, now can only live in this little area. So the problem is, let's say this creature here needs to move to here to, to mate or to breed. Now they can't get to that other fragmented area. So this is why it's a big problem. They aren't able to breed. They aren't able to find resources and the food that they need. And so the creatures become extinct if they cannot adapt. Most creatures can adapt, but it takes thousands of years for natural selection. And unfortunately, we're doing this, um, you know, within hundreds of years. So that's the issue. The animals aren't having uh, enough time to adapt to the habitat destruction and fragmentation. All right. So that was the H. Uh, the next one we're going to talk about on the HIPCO is the I, which are invasive species. So what are invasive species? Many species introductions are beneficial. OK, um, so sometimes you bring species into into another uh, area and it actually helps out. However, most of the times that's not the case. Non-native species may have no natural predators, com uh, competitors, parasites or pathogens to help control their population. Non-native species can then crowd out native species, okay? And then they're viewed as harmful invasive species if they basically crowd out or cause native species to go away. If they take over the land, uh, then, they're, then they are viewed as, as harmful. So here are just some of the, uh, on the top, you have deliberately introduced species um, that, we intro that we actually deliberately introduced that are now uh, causing problems. Uh, so that's a, a, a plant, the purple loosestrife. The African honeybee, which is the killer bee, is actually uh, one of the reasons why we are seeing our honeybee population decline because they actually take over hives and they're so aggressive that they uh, kill or basically take out all the uh, all the uh, European honeybees. Uh, the cutso vine, we'll talk about that in a second, um, that little animal called the nutria, and the European wild boar, the feral pig. Again, we introduced these species, um, and they're uh, basically invasive now. Uh, on the bottom are accidentally introduced species. So the sea lamprey, uh, the Argentine fire ant, okay, the Burmese python, the Formosian termite and the zebra mussel, okay, have all been accidentally introduced um, and here and unfortunately here in the U.S. and unfortunately are causing many problems. So uh, the case study here talks about the kudzo vine and kudzo bugs. They were imported from Japan in the 1930s to help control soil erosion. However, they spread very rapidly, taking over the land. They're very difficult to kill. Uh, a, common, a common fungus can kill it, uh, but we need to investigate the harmful side effects of that common fungus. Some potential benefits, medicinal, nutritional uses, maybe use as paper or, or a biofuel. But you'll notice this is a picture, okay, of... Um, of the cutso vine here, I believe this is eh, somewhere in the U.S. And you'll notice how the vine has basically overgrown this car. And I'll argue this car uh, wasn't put there yesterday. It probably was there for for you know bunch of years, but this is how uh, aggressive this vine is in growing. And so you can see how it can take over land and then basically push out or not allow native species uh, to actually survive and to grow. And so that becomes obviously a major problem uh, for, that, for that particular ecosystem. So some accidentally introduced species can disrupt ecosystems as well. So the kudzo vine that was brought in purposefully, uh, we've had some ac accidental in introductions here, the Burmese python, African python, and boa constrictors in Florida, uh, pets imported from Africa and Asia, and then released into the Everglade wetlands. Uh, predation by these animals is altering food webs and ecosystem services, right? Because they shouldn't be there. Uh, they are kind of at the top of the food chain. And so now uh, it's altering uh, the food webs uh, in the Everglades. So for instance, believe it or not, this is a Burmese python that was caught uh, by these guys in the Florida Everglades. Everglades. It was just living there. Again, it was accidentally brought in uh, or, 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 or put in. Uh, actually, you know, people just thinking out a pet. We don't want it anymore. We'll just uh, leave it outside. And uh, this is what could happen. And this is what could end up uh, could end up uh, could end up in in the environment. And again, they're not native to the Everglades, and, and so are messing up uh, the food webs uh, in in the Everglades. And obviously, uh, that is a concern. Okay, so that's going to end uh, part one of my lecture on chapter nine. Sustaining Biodiversity, Saving Species and Ecosystem Services. Make sure to check back in for part two. And as always, thanks for listening.